Welcome to a little webinar called Blog Syndicate Done. It's um, probably the most stressful of all the webinars I do because I put myself under probably some very unnecessary pressure to write a blog post in this actual webinar. So not only am I going to be showing you how to do it, I'm going to be doing it myself. That's absolutely terrifying for me. My name is Don Tyson James. I'll be taking you through. Let's share screen and get it underway. First of all, it is thanks to Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program in conjunction with Regional Development Australia Brisbane and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory. There's a quote from Sylvia Platt saying, everything in life is writable about if you have the outgoing guts to do it and the indignation, sorry, the imagination to improvise. The worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt. So we're going to be testing some of that theory today with a bit of um, a bit of on the spot teaching of not just how to write a blog, but how for, how I write blogs myself. This is how I do them almost every single day. The busy, uh, the blogging method is fast. So this is who it's for. We're also looking for people who are overthinkers who tend to absolutely go too far with all these things. We're also looking for the beginner, the person who's not even sure what the word blog even means. We're gonna look at this in terms of what is blogging, how you should bother with it and why you should actually give it a really good, a really red hot go, I think. And also looking uh, at the myths around blogging the myth are especially around what we call the tortured writer. You know, we're talking about like, you have to be so hard pressed to write and it has to be so difficult to write. It actually doesn't have to be if you follow a formula. We'll look at also syndicating a blog a little bit later to some other places around the internet so you can get a little bit more out of it than just simply writing a single blog. Bit about me, I work with Google's digital springboard program on contract, as well as working with uh, the Boost With Facebook program for Facebook Australia and New Zealand. Um, I've got tons of certifications all over the place, but more recently started to do some stuff with Maclay College in Sydney, with the University of New South Wales Business School, where I was actually educated in my Masters of Business Information Systems, and got a swag of things from the Chartered Institute of Marketing. Enough about me. We want to get onto what your blog is all about. So... What is a blog? It's a place for you to show your expertise where you can write about the stuff you know, even if that stuff you think is quite boring. It's what helps to attract searches in Google. It's because it's what you're writing about is what people are searching for. It's about repurposing and syndicating. So taking what you've written and putting it out to other places on the internet, not just your website. It was once upon a time, uh, a big no-no to repeat the content in other places around the web, but that has changed significantly now. You can put it into social media, you can put it into other online publications, just about anywhere you can find on the web that will take publications like your blog. So there is a very specific process to blogging. Um, now there's many people who've written many different ways of how you do it, but this is based upon how I would do it. I would do it based upon uh, doing research into what your topic should be. So I've got a formula for that just a little bit further down when we're going to take, go into the actual specifics of how to write the blog and you watch me do one. Um, you can use things like Google search suggestions. So you just start typing something into Google and it automatically comes up with some suggestions in there of what people seem to be searching for. Now that's based upon a bit of your use in Google, but also a bit of the use of people around you in Google. So if you start searching for mechanic, it's most likely going to bring up mechanic, cool engineer or mechanic, and then a local area that will give you some ideas about the kind of stuff to write for. And then you, when you found that research about the sort of thing you want to write on, you then write your blog on that topic using a really simple formula I'm going to show you. It's really easy to remember and it's really repeatable. And then you publish and you syndicate it out. You publish it first to the place that's most useful to you. That's usually going to be your website if you've got one. If not, it could be on social media. It could be as an article on LinkedIn even. Post it there first then we can go posting it out to a bunch of other places as well. So this magic formula I keep talking about is so easy and so rememberable and so, uh, so repeatable is this one. You start off with a title that asks a question. So you ask a common question that is often asked about the things that you do. 
then you answer that question. So you answer it directly in the very first paragraph that you've written. If you can, write it into the first sentence. That's even more impacting because Google are reading that and going, here's a question, here's an answer. This is authoritative and this is how they've written and they've answered lots of other questions that people are asking about that product or service in their local area. Then this is a good place to start searching in those featured snippets that are coming up on Google. You know how when you type in a question to Google these days and doesn't necessarily take you to a website, it actually produces the answer within the browser right there in front of you. That's what we're talking about, you getting a, pay, a piece of. And also explaining your answer a bit further down in expanded points and dot points maybe to start with and then expanding it out. Kind of like when you wrote an essay back in high school, if you can remember that back that long. For me, it was very long time ago, uh, but it used to be, you'd have an introduction, you'd have a sort of a, a hypothesis, and then you'd have the introduction that sort of answered that and said, I will prove this. And then you proved it over three main points that you did over the course of a whole assignment. We're doing a very similar thing here, but it's a, a little more fun, a little less tedious. So what about regular web pages? This is, we're talking about blogs so far, that's great but there's also all the other pages on your website that are not part of your articles are not part of your blog. And we're talking about just regular pages of content. Well, this formula works for that too, because you can start off with something like figuring out what the top 10 things that your clients or customers ask you about. So when they're coming in, you'd have a, you'd have a list of the, you just know by the look of the guy walking through the door, exactly the question he's going to be asking for you or by the, by the look on the person's face or the woman on her face, as she walks into your restaurant, you know exactly what she's going to order because there's certain patterns that emerge in every single business. The same thing goes for the kind of things that customers ask you. So we're looking for, first of all, the top 10 things that your clients or customers are going to ask you. And then there's another top 10. That's top 10 of the things that you wish your customers would ask you. The information that you really think should be out there a lot more commonly that people just don't seem to bother to ask. They just don't know that that's even a possibility. And you'd like to be able to push that through. That forms then 20 pieces of content, which is potentially 20 pages of content on a website or 20 social media posts even, or 20 posts on LinkedIn or articles on LinkedIn or on Medium, or you choose the place you wanna publish it to. And then you just simply follow that exact same formula that we have before. I'll tell you this back a screen, ask a question, answer the question, then expand about it in about three points. And then you can expand it about a bit further. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an example of what this is gonna be very shortly, but before I do, we're first gonna look at the, the problem with blogging sometimes coming from a business is, you know, we think of ourselves as the center of the universe because we own a business, you yeah, know, it's kind of natural. I've got a couple of businesses, you've probably got a business or two. It's all about putting ourselves at the very center of it because let's face it, it's if we don't do the work and we don't get motivated about it, we're not gonna make the money. But in this case, we're gonna take a step back a little bit and go that we are not the center of the point, the point of this. What it is, it's the customer and what they're looking to ask. What are the things that they want to know about? So that's going to involve us aiming it at the kind of language that's about them. What's in it for them rather than us going, here's more about me. Here's more about me. You'll notice that a bit earlier on in the slides, I, I tend to like rush through the stuff about me because the stuff I have to cover to show you that I actually got permission to be able to speak about these things. But at the same time, I don't want to get too into that because it's not actually about me. It's about you, about you learning a particular tool. Same with your website or any of the online writing you're doing. It's about what's in it for them, not what's, here's some more stuff about me. Also consider your tone. Who are you writing this for? Who is your customer? Are they Harvard educated or from Oxford? Are they younger? Is English their second language they're speaking? Are they male, female? Do they come from a particular socioeconomic background? Or do they come from a very educated background where you need to speak up a little bit more? And then you go about and be inspired by the people who are doing this well already. Now, I'm not saying copy and paste exactly everything that your competitors who are doing well have done on their website. I'm just saying be inspired by it. See what they've asked. 
quite often they're asking the kind of questions that your customers are asking too. So you can use those questions on your website. And in fact, if you have competitors who have pages all about asking and answering questions that are very, very similar to what you have from your customers, copy the same questions and then just answer it in your way. There's nothing wrong with you copying the questions because let's face it, they don't have a copyright on the questions that your customers are asking you or the questions that you want to ask as well. The great question coming from Extreme VR to all of us is saying, do you think it's important to write huge amounts of content rather than keeping the relevant information in a small number of short and sharp paragraphs? Most often I find there is a large amount of content that I just skip over looking for the answer I'm looking for. Amen. You've answered that question yourself. Google used to be very much about rewarding long, laborious things. It started off with a 300 word passage was ideal. Then it became 600 words and then 900, then 1200. Then when it got about 3000 words, I think Google started to understand that the search patterns on Google were happening very differently than what they used to, especially when mobile phones came around and we used to say, Hey Siri or Hey G that I can't say because all my phones light up like Christmas trees, but Hey G word. Um, ask a question, get an answer. So this new format is all about getting people to the answer as quick as possible, not lingering on your website for as long as possible. Google used to only be able to mention, uh, to only be able to measure through the old Google Analytics visits to a website based on sessions. So it used to be this whole theory that if someone landed on your website and stuck around for ages, that that was a really good thing. Now what Google does, it's far more, uh, far more oriented towards what it calls measuring intent. So not just the fact that someone visits your site, but looks at the intent that they're visually visiting your site with. And that comes from a bunch of information about the, the search patterns that, that person already has. It also looks at where were they just where before you, they hit this site that you're on. So they went to another site and they were looking for particular information, stop when they got to a certain part of a page with text, then they can get a fairly good idea of what the intent may be for the next site they're going to that might be quite similar in terms of its content or its products and its services. So that intent measurement is what they're looking for. So if someone comes in with the intent of reading a long laborious article because they just did it on the last three websites, then having a long laborious article can be good. But I don't know about you, I don't spend a lot of time reading really long articles online. I usually go online to find an answer to a question that I need to know, and I want to get that answer as soon as possible. And all the articles seem to come up with this great big long intro of guff, 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 until finally you get to the point. And it's just horrible. It's like YouTube videos. So I'm just looking for the answer to the question I'm looking for. I want to get it and I want to get out. And I'm happy for the person who gave me that to actually get my loyalty next time for when I need to go and look for an answer again. I want to get it from them because they answered it really quickly for me. So long story short there, Extreme VR, it's all about trying to get to the answer as soon as possible. And this is what this formula does. It doesn't make it a great big long article. It makes it something which is much more achievable. So we're going to write a blog now. I'm gonna look for a volunteer here. Now we've got a bunch of people online right now. Um, to the people who are watching this on YouTube, uh, just pop your questions and comments in the, uh, the comment boxes below. But for the people who are live on the webinar right now, just uh, give me a rundown of the businesses you're in. So just um, not so much the name of the business, just what you do. If you can just do that quickly in the chat window. And I'm just gonna pick one or two, or I'm actually going to write an example blog for you based on the fact that I don't know your businesses. Um, actually put your business name in there too. Um, that could be helpful because then I can look you up, do a little bit of research. I'll show you the process I go through for that. I'm actually going to go into something like Google's keyword planner, where I'm going to find out a little bit more about that. And we're going to find out a bit more. So we've got uh, Kirsty in there first, metabolism testing, weight loss, and chronic disease. Fantastic. We've got Letitia, who's a virtual assistant podcast manager for dynamic virtual assistants. I know this one quite well because I did a uh, SEO, uh, not, it was an SEO check on it. Oh, no, a story brand check on this from one of my previous um, one of my previous uh, workshops. And um, Maggi is involved with a local Lions Club and need help writing full stop. That's fantastic. Um, Extreme VR hires virtual reality equipment and interactive games to corporate clients across Australia. And we've got an eco shop in Cairns, Environment Australia. We've got um, 
someone who's providing schools with speakers, workshops, and excursions for students or incursions. Sorry, is that like the opposite of an excursion? Incursion sounds like something that happened at the um, Washington DC Capitol recently. <laughs> it doesn't sound right. Um, well, I'll do. I'm going to stop sharing this particular screen and start sharing uh, one I did prepare earlier, which is this document here. So I'm just going to pick out um, one of these ones to start with. Let's just go... Well, who was first? It was metabolism testing with Kirsty. So Kirsty, I'm going to go, this is to do with metabolism testing. Let's move my thing across so I can do a bit of typing. You can see how terrible my typing can be. Metabolism testing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that term and I'm going to go into Google. Once I get past this um, silly thing, there we go. All right, so let's put into metabolism testing immediately. It's given me some ideas, metabolism testing kit, metabolism testing device, New York City, Perth, Melbourne, UK. So I could say near me. So let's have a look who's doing it near me. I'm in Darwin. So it's going to give me some answers that are very much about me, uh, where I am. So being in Darwin, it's giving me these options here. Now, here's a bunch of questions that people are already asking in the world about metabolism testing. So I could say almost straight away that any one of these would be a great idea to get an answer for. So how do you get your metabolism tested? So there's Healthline here has got this information here. I'm just going to go, what is, I'm going to ask a question, what is metabolism testing? That's going to be the title of my blog. So what is metabolism testing? So if someone's asking that when they go on the Google, we want them to find our, our response to it. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is answer that question. So I'm going to ask that question. Meta, oh, oh gosh, Ta meta, oh, it's so testing. You can tell I don't type this in very often. So here you go. What is metabolic sleep testing for uh, weight loss? So it's given me a result here. So I can say what it basically is. So it's something to do with... Um, measuring the rate which your body burns calories. So I'm going to take a bit of this words. I'm going to change this right now. This is the perfect example of a blog that's being written in the format we're talking about. They go on a bit of guff beforehand, which you don't necessarily need to go into because we're not, this is written in a magazine style. But if you get to this point, it is, here's the answer. Bang, right up in the first paragraph. Then we split it into three different sections there. And then they expand on it. So they go into the resting metabolic rate. So you can get the basics basically from, from here to here. And you know most of what the average person who's looking for what a meta met metabolic, met metabolic test is struggling. I picked the wrong one, didn't I? Uh, so what it is, is it's just basically there. It's all right there for what it is. And then we can go, okay, we can go deeper into that. What is the resting metabolic rate test what is the exercise testing what is met metabolism test for weight loss which looks like the one that you're doing right here so we can be inspired by this or what i'm going to do uh, kirsty i'm going to ask you what is the number one thing that people ask you when they come to you as um as someone who's wanting to get uh met metabolism met metabolic testing i'm going to struggle with this all night i'm just going to have a bit more coffee i think i need it there we go, kick in, kick in, kick in. So Kirstie, the first question that comes to mind that people will ask you when they're coming to you to look at having a metabolic test done for their weight loss. This is gonna be a really good one because um, it's gonna be one of those things that really makes you think and go, you know what, this is, this is actually a ton of questions you're gonna come up with of what people are already asking. You'll build things around that. So if it takes us a while to come up with that, I'll just jump ahead because um, it might take us a while to get that answer. So I go, what is metabolism testing or met metabolic testing? So in the, in the realm of what you're doing, it's all about testing for weight loss. So I'm just finding out a little bit from this and going, uh, metabolism test weight loss, different reasons based on your resting, let's say you're trying to estimate total number of calories you burn every day without exercise. So that's a really good point. We can try that one. Or oh, you have to put in there, how is it done and how much? So we can try how is metabolic testing done? I'm gonna make that our title because that's one that's really, really common for you. It'd be a great one to start with. 
So the simple question is, now what I might do, uh, Kirsty, I'm gonna promote you into being a, um, in a participant, so if you don't mind hopping on your uh, microphone, and I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions. So um, are you there, Kirsty? Hopefully. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, thank you. Brilliant. All right, so how is this metabolic testing done? After Explain it to test. me. So let's do it, for, so it's a breath test. Yep. So I'm going to put that in, breath test. And what are we testing for? Uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen and CO2, okay. And the name of it, which is was on the article, is indirect calorimetry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you may regret this. I'm definitely, I'm regretting this already, trust me. This is like, this is why this is the most stressful webinar I ever do, because I always throw myself in the deep end and just pick the wrong person. <laughs> so oxygen and CO2. And so what is um, what is oxygen and CO2 level going to tell you? Um, if your metabolism is slow, uh, if your body's burning fat. Um, the difference between the two. So one is if your metabolism is fast or slow, because a lot of people blame a slow metabolism for them not causing weight loss. Yeah, I, um, I've, been, I've been playing with that idea for years. So it must be yeah. my metabolism. It's not the fact that I eat way too much and exercise way yeah. too. <laughs> um, it's And for a lot of people, that's where the second bit comes in. It's generally not that they're not exercising or eating too much. It's that their body's burning glucose instead of fat, which makes weight loss and hard and leads to chronic disease right now we're starting to hit the hit the hit the jackpot so we're starting to look at some of the reasons behind it so we can start off with um if you've been wondering why you can exercise all day whoops all day and still not lose weight Oh my goodness. Um, then it might be time for you to try a metabolic test. What is a metabolic test? It will, it is. Um, so I'm going to go in the dot points, administered via a breath test it is a measurement of um, your breaths oxygen and carbon dioxide um what we say ratio for your fat um or you could say um a measurement of expired oxygen and carbon dioxide Okay, of expired. Okay, so in human language, yeah, um, a measurement of expired. So it's a measurement of the oxygen, the oxygen and carbon dioxide, dioxide you breathe out. You breathe perfect. You're breathing out. Because remember, we're talking to the average person here. Yep. Okay, can tell you whether it is um, a test of whether your exercise is burning glucose. Not, not necessarily exercise, because we're talking about it can be done at rest or exercise. How about everyday activity? Yeah. Everyday activity. So that has basically, in a Google sense, has answered the question straight away. is how it's done and what it is. So that would be a, a really good answer for somebody looking for Google how it's done. So administered by a breath test. Oh, that doesn't sound scary. I'll go ahead and do that. Or it's a, and then it's, it explains a little bit um, about what it is. So it's a measurement of a certain thing and it's a test of ultimately finding out this, whether you're burning glucose or fat with your everyday activity. Then what we would do is go out a bit further and expand on it. Like that other article did, it started off with those dot points and then it expanded it right out. So that's what we were doing here. We're going some, um, the breath test. So this will be like our subheading. Yep. So I'll just uh, play around a little bit with subheadings. There we go. 
Um, now, where would I go to get that breath test? Um, obviously, the clinics I run have it, but you can go to universities as well. Specialised clinic and some universities. You may need to, okay, how are they going to find out where these things are? To check online to see which clinics and unis do these tests. Yeah, so the, the keyword they might need to search is um, indirect calorimetry because unfortunately with metabolism tests, people say like a, a blood test looks at their metabolism, but it doesn't. So what so is that word you're trying to tell me? Indirect. Indirect. Calorimetry. That one yeah. right. Awesome. See, so Google. that's what they want to search for. There we go. Um, and they might need to follow some pre-test instructions for that one as well. Okay. So looking for an for accurate that. result. But don't just rock up to the clinic. There may be a few things you need to do first before you get your test. And what would those be? Um, so fasting. Required to. And dot points. Google loves a dot point. So don't be afraid to do more. Fasting from eating for a period of time. Yeah. No exercise. Well, um, we do 12 hours, but depending on the protocol they run. That not refrain is too fancy a word. What's a not fancy word? Um, no exercise. Yeah. For up to 12 hours in some cases. Yep. Um, take medications as per normal. They're the main ones. Some good places to start would be, um, would, who, who would refer you to this kind of thing? Um, your, your GP, but generally, you can generally see these people privately. You don't need a referral. And make bookings privately. Um, as well. So that has done the first bit of it. And that essentially would not necessarily be enough for a blog itself, but we're getting close. What we then might want to do is take this, this measurement. So what it measures. So the simple answer is already up there in the dot points. We've already figured out what it does. So you were explaining to me something else. So what's the significance of the oxygen and carbon dioxide measurement? So from the oxygen, you can see whether your metabolism is fast or slow. So from your oxygen level? Um, yeah, oh, from the amount of oxygen. Yep. Used. Let's try that again. <laughs> oh my goodness, come on. From the oxygen used. This is one of those times where I wish I'd taken up proper typing when I was young. Mm -hmm. So from the oxygen used. Um, the test can tell you if your metabolism is slow. If you have a slow metabolism. Or a fast metabolism. Yep. And these, uh, come on, you can do it. Um, this is often, often what people refer to when they may exercise, but fail to lose weight. Not necessarily. No. <laughs> no um, and that's where the next one comes in. So that's the first one. Yep. But when you look at the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide is when you can see if they're burning fat. And if there's issues with either of these, it can make weight loss difficult. To carbon dioxide, you can tell if there may be an issue that could contribute 
to issues, uh, to problems or um, yeah, problems with losing weight, the ability to lose weight. All right, so what we can do in here um, is then expand on something like, um, if you had a slow metabolism, you may notice that, what, is the, what are the hallmarks of a slow metabolism? Uh, they might feel fatigued and sluggish. Sluggish. Ugh. Can yep. I make a suggestion? Yep. Um, maybe as a general thing is if your metabolism isn't working as it should, and these yep. are the signs, because a lot of them overlap, similar if you're not burning fat. Yeah, so it could be that. Um, so if your metabolism isn't working as it should, you may notice that you feel fatigued or sluggish. Yep. Um, Difficulties with weight loss, trouble sleeping. Get hungry and have cravings. Uh, tired after eating. You may feel that you get tired after eating. So I think what you're starting to see here is this is basically what a, an article would have, would be like. And at the end, you can wrap it up with almost like a repeat of all this. So, or saying to find out more, in your case, um, call or email and then you can wrap it up just with something really short like that as a call to action. Now that might be a call to action on the page or it might be a um, you know, some kind of button that's pressed, but that would wrap it up. That is enough for any blog post these days unless you want to go into a whole academic exposition about it. But just remember there is a place for that, but that may not be for the average person to do that. They can find that through these universities if they really wanted to get an academic exposition upon what metabolic testing is. Does that make sense, Kirsty? Yep. Fantastic. Thanks Thank for you. that. So you get the idea that there's a certain way that you then go, okay, this is how we do it. We start off with a question. We answer that question in the first paragraph. And then we sort of expand it out a bit. In this case, we expanded out into three main sections of this particular topic. And then we started writing them all. Now, it didn't mean that we had to expand on all three of those because in essence, this bit here did cover those second two just here. So the same thing can happen on any kind of business. So we can say, um, uh, I've got Sarah here, who's audience and sponsorship manager at a Cairns radio station, Cairns Community Radio. I might give that a go. I've actually um, chatted with Sarah before, actually. Um, Sarah, I'm just going to bring you forward and we can have a very quick chat and we'll do the same kind of thing with you. How are you doing, Sarah? Are you there? Yes, I am. I feel like I'm, feel like I'm operating the Talkback Radio at the moment. <laughs> it's very interactive, that's for sure. You think, I, you think I've probably done this before. It's, uh, I, I did work in radio many, many years ago, so hopefully some of those skills are still sitting nice and calmly in my head. All right, so what is one of the questions that people may ask you about your community radio station? Um, how, do, how do I get on air? How can I become an announcer? Yeah, how do I become a radio star? A radio. <laughs> <laughs> I need to call it that, because that's what I wanted to be when I was a little kid. I wanted to be a radio star. So, um, and Patricia has to leave us. So thank you, um, Patricia. This will be playing on uh, YouTube a little bit later on. So in about um, two hours time, I'll have it loaded up on the YouTube. Just look for my name, Author Business Station, and it'll be there for you. That's for everyone too, that will become available. So you're gonna become a star, Sarah. 
on, on, on YouTube now, and I'm going to become a radio star. So the first thing is how do I become a radio star? Having done it myself and how you've done it yourself, and you've been able to do it as well. Um, what is the question, the answer, the most direct answer to that question that you can possibly find? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I guess you have to know the reason why. Yeah, um, you know, what, why do you want to get on radio? What, what, what do you want to do? What, what do you... So, that, so that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a quite a philosophical question. But this person <laughs> doesn't about the why. They just want to become a radio star. So they're just like, right. how do I become a radio star? How do you, okay. So I would say, yeah, get in contact with your local community radio station. The first thing to do is to get in touch <coughs> excuse me, with your local community radio station. And why would they do that? Why would they do that? Well, they could... That, uh, uh, Charter is all about uh, supporting people in the media to get on air. So uh, we're, you know, a community radio station that um, offers that opportunity to basically, yeah, get on, get on radio. And um, I'm not being very, uh, so I'm not, nowhere near as concise as Kirsty was or Christy was. No, that, that's, mm. that's, that's actually not too bad. So I'm actually going ahead and writing it anyway. So yeah. with, um, community radio station is all about developing talent and giving a voice to members of the community who are interested in. in yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And th that's perfect. Yeah. You'd think so you've done it before, Dante. Yeah, no, I, did start <laughs> I started a radio myself, so I've got a bit of fun. Hello. So then we can yeah. expand that out to some bullet points. How do I become a radio star? So I'll have here some other things you may want to consider other things you may want to consider. Would be dot point one. What is your reason for wanting to be on the wireless? Yeah. <laughs> uh, second thing would be, um, what do you think you could bring to an audience on radio? Yeah. And the third one could be, are we the right community radio station for you? So then we can actually expand those out and go, okay. Turn that into our next subheading or something like it. I'm going to call that, what is your why? Okay. And then in that we can go, um, sometimes when our volunteers join us, they want to um, go straight on air. However, they discover that there are a myriad of things to do in the average radio station. There's audio production, um, sales, yep. promotions, even admin, admin even. Um, I was going to say social media as well is um, part of, very much part of it these days as well. Yep, there we go. Social media. Um, and as you're saying, answering the phones, that's even a good idea, answering the phones. Yep. Even cleaning the toilets. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes um, our volunteers spend years doing everything. Oh, I'm typing. I'm just going to ignore my spelling errors. So just as yeah. if you can forgive them, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> doing everything they can not to be on air because they've found many other things to do around the station. Yeah. Oops. My um, monitor keeps... Because there's... Um, and there's presenters who actually need producers, you know, who um, would like support in getting their program ready and getting content and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, there's... Uh, producing's a, a really key role as well. Uh, 
who can help the show to run smoothly. Yeah, perfectly, perfect, yeah. So if you are the kind of person who likes to help, then being on air may not actually be the thing that you love most. Okay, so that's that's one paragraph. So why do you think what do you think you can bring? So I can go, what is unique about you? Is our second one. Bring it up a bit higher so you can read it. And so what is unique about you is addressing this second point. So what do you think you bring to an audience on radio? So that can be um, people love to hear from people who are interesting. Whether they love gardening, jazz, trains, planes, or cricket, um, there's a place for everybody. There is. For every kind of interest in community radio. Have a think about the following. Number one, um, what is your unique interest? Do you have some great stories to tell? Are there others in the community who could join you? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. We're looking for people with diverse experiences and backgrounds. So call us to have a chat. So this in essence could be a page on your, on your, on your website that could be all about how to become a radio star. So that's almost the answer. Now we can go in there. I would the right community radio station for you. This would be more if you're one of the particular community stations that had a specific ethical base or maybe a religious station. We can say, look, we do require the people on air have this kind of belief or this kind of ethos about them. Um, you could go further into that. But this essentially is enough to power a page on your website because it answers the question, how do I become a radio star? Or how do I, how do, you know, obviously not become a radio star. How do I get on the radio? So, yeah. like, so that answers that question and it answers it really, really quickly. In that yeah. If you don't mind, Dante, I'll, I'm going to, would like to use that on our Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can probably correct your spelling though. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I just, um, I just took a screenshot. So, because I think that's really, really great. I think it just does a very, um, you know, uh, it's very simple, but it, it gets the point. And it's a good starting point because I'd, I'd like to do some blogging for Facebook and not so much for our website, but definitely for Facebook. All right. Well, I'll, I can send you a proper version of this too. So you don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to do that screenshot. I'll send you a copy of this through you. I've got your email here somewhere. I'm sure of it. Um, okay. and so in this one where you're answering that question, you're doing it really quickly and then you're giving options for people to expand to go further. So Google likes that you're answering it quickly. They also like that you're expanding on it. If you really wanted to expand on and get the maximum value out of Google, what you would do is you would actually ask questions under here as well. So rather than what is your why, you'd actually probably be better off for Google sense to go with that subtitle that you just had in there and repeat it. So that was the best way for Google to notice it. And again, you're in, you're in Cairns. So you would say, how do I get on the radio in Cairns is actually a much more powerful statement with Google because it localizes it for someone oh, right. to okay. ask the question. So that is even more specific. That's how there's so many people who are not located in Cairns for things like um, very specialist sort of areas, but they become the first result coming up for a search in Cairns because they've actually mentioned it directly. They're not just saying, how do I do social media? They're saying, how do I do social media to reach an audience in Cairns? Very specific for a very specific audience, but yeah. it will be the first answer that comes up for that person in that area. Hmm. That's a, yeah, really, that's a really good one in there. So I'll keep that aside for you. 
Thanks, Dante. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. That's awesome. So you can see that there's a whole lot of options you can go into for writing these. I reckon I've got time for maybe one more to put in there. I can't remember. We started at 5.30 my time. It's 6.14 now. I think we've got time for another one. So if we go into a question here from Sharon, actually, she's asking, what happens if you sell your services Australia-wide? So a lot of that kind of thing would be that you can start creating, and I did this for um, a, a business consulting firm that I contract to. We were doing um, COVID-19 business advice during the, the height of the pandemic in Australia, which was around that March, April, May, June kind of period. And what we did, we wrote a whole bunch of pages which had basically the same stuff on it, but localized it and said, I'm worried about COVID-19, the, the, worried about the effect on the COVID-19 effect on your business in Maruya in New South Wales, for instance, and that would worried about how COVID-19 is it going to affect your Murray Bridge business, worried about how COVID-19 will affect your Cairns business, and then customised each page. All up, we had about 47 pages. They're all pretty much the same content, but they contained the name specifically for that area and referred to other suburbs in that area as well. And then a couple of features about it. All up, it probably took me one day to write that. Now I just was dedicated to doing that. Yes, I write a lot, so it's a bit quicker for me to do it. But the more you do it, the faster you get. Um, the average person probably take two or three days and 47 new pages appeared. So what started to happen is if you went to look for the COVID-19, and these are down now, so you won't find them. But if you're looking for this in, say, Albany in Western Australia, um, we came up as the first response for COVID-19 support in Albany, although our business was late located in Darwin, but we're still serving people in that area. So the answer to that, Sharon, is that you provide content that's very specific for lots of different areas rather than just going, we sell it to Australia. That just makes um, it doesn't localize it. You want to actually use the localizing effect of Google, which does prioritize local responses to local questions. Um, then localize that content as much as you can to as many different markets as you can. Could be Sydney, could be Melbourne, big markets, or be little markets like Dubbo, Orange, Catherine, Alice Springs, Emerald, Charleville, um, Kununurra, any of those kind of areas where you can just go keep it that particular local angle. Then got um, one more room for one more, I reckon. Um, got an eco shop in Cairns as well. I might just go that one, eco shop in Cairns. Let's see how that goes. goes. Um, oh, Greg, you got a good question. That is going to get answered after I do this next one. Um, that's a really, 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 really good question uh, that's come up, which is, does Google not penalize you for duplicate content or scan one page all with similar content? I will answer that. Just it'll be the next thing I do. So let's create a new one that's based upon um, the stuff that we're going to do for the Eco Shopping Cans Environment Australia. I'm just going to bring Environment on here. I don't have Environment's name. Hopefully you're ready to come on and talk. Hello, Environmart. Might need to unmute you though. There we go. No, not unmuting. There we go. You're on. Long time listener, first time caller. Is that how it goes? No, not coming through. That's quite okay. It looks like we might not get that one through. Okay, I'll just say that I'll probably have to choose someone else I can bring up really quickly. How about Greg, uh, who provides uh, speakers, uh, schools with speakers and all that sort of stuff. Greg, you're on, aren't you? Hopefully your microphone's working. Uh, I think I am. Hi. That's looking very promising. Thank you, Greg, for coming on. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, ask, what's one of the top questions that someone will ask you, one of the schools will ask you? Uh, what kinds of speakers can I book? And this is one of the, the problems is, you know, when I say speakers, it can refer to obviously sound speakers, um, that maybe guest speakers, but then there's also talks, workshops, um, and that lovely word, um, incursions. <laughs> I hate that word already. Speakers. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> and it is the opposite of incursions. Yeah. <laughs> It's like one of those words, it can be like a really bad feeling about that word or a really good feeling about that word. So what kind of speakers, presenters and workshops, workshops. can I book? So that's probably taking it right out there and it's giving us a chance to answer three questions. I like doing things in threes because the, 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 
the average Western person does deal really well with knowledge in threes. And I always try to do no more than three points in everything I do. So in a blog sense, that's also really good. And for Google structured data, which actually measures and compiles all this information that's coming out of our websites, starts with a three, bullet points of three. It likes three, four, and five as a number of bullet points, but it can go further as well, as long as there's at least three. So that's a good place to start. So tell me what kind of speakers, presenters, and workshops can I book? Um, it's probably divided even further than that, but if you were to, to, to sort of try to divide it into three separate areas, it would be um, supporting learning area curriculum. So learning areas refer to arts, um, sciences, uh, English, mathematics, those sorts of things. So learning areas is, is sort of a key word for educators. So depending on the learning area, we can provide um, a presenter. So I'm, I'm playing around with the words presenters and speakers here. Okay. They're going to be really interchangeable. But, yeah. And there's a reason for that, because some are going to search for presenters, some mm. are going to search for speakers, and some are going to search for workshops. So we can provide a presenter um, that can deliver um, a talk or an interactive workshop on specific oh, yeah specific um or on them? a range of topics on a, or on a range of uh specific subject um subjects yeah so that, that gives us the basic that's, that's great that's, that's the direct answer which is what we want so the next thing would be how do we expand that out so as Sharon just asked, we're talking about lists of bullet points, uh, so not a list of 10. A list of 10 is fine. It just may not show the whole list of 10 in the search results. But for a shorter list, like three, four, five, six, it will show the whole lot. But if you have 10, it's still not a bad thing. You just gotta have at least three. You can have 25 mm. if you want to, as long mm. as there's at least three points. Um, so what we can say is um, some of the most common requests we get for speakers, is for point one. Uh, let's say authors, author talks. Talks from authors or talks yep. from authors. Um, is these the authors of kids' books? Uh, everything from, uh, everything sort of from kindergarten up to year 12. So it would be that there's sort of dead, uh, different categories. So there's middle um, readers and young adult um novels and picture books would be sort of at the other end yep all right so what's uh, another common one uh talks on leadership and um sort of leadership resilience well-being which is sort of grouped in together as um 21st century skills um, is yeah. that what is 21st century skills what someone would actually be looking for uh yeah maybe 21st century skills including leadership um uh you know it, it includes all sorts of sorts of things like um skills. Do it. and yep. what's the third area you reckon it could be really good you notice though when i do this because this is comes as my background as a copywriter mm -hmm. i i it's very most people who are very close to their businesses and what they do yes. expand endlessly into this and write a lot of stuff. Uh, what I do as a copywriter, I break that down and go, give me the points, give me the points. Yeah, and, is, and then we make that into something which is quite yeah, I'm the guy that gets lost in way too much detail. So that's yeah. great. So um, let's make the third one. Um, uh, talks uh, on science including STEM and STEAM, with STEM is in capitals. Yeah. Um, um, topics, not tropics. Topics including STEM and STEAM workshops, perhaps. There you go, perfect. So then what you can do is expand that out. So we can yeah. say um, talks from authors. Yeah. And make that one, because that's one's gonna be a big one because that just brings kids to life. When I met um, authors when I was a kid during book week, it just really excited yeah. me because I was a nerdy kid. <laughs> me too. 
<laughs> no surprise given what you're, what you're working in. <laughs> <Maybe. right? laughs> so he talks from authors. So you can say um, we feature um, a recurring roster of, of authors, of children's and young adults, and you can span it out as much as you like, uh, books um, that students will know and love. Um, apart from speaking about the books and character or the, the books themselves and the characters within, I'm taking complete creative yeah, license here. Great. Characters within the authors. Um, oh, <laughs> can share uh, stories of their own childhood. challenges, obstacles, and inspirational messages of overcoming, of, let's say, of uh, resilience and overcoming. Um, to book an author for your next um, incursion, <laughs> <laughs> please contact us on number and and during and on that um dante just a, a quick question as an example on that so i would have um i have an author's um category and therefore yeah. an author's page so i would put those hyperlinks yeah yeah so there's two ways now this is a, another really good point when it comes to this is that there's two very different ways to write there's a write this as content on your website that is that's for someone who's moving around your website and navigating and discovering stuff there's also content that's written specifically for google and that's what we call a landing page okay. so a landing page is to attract a search in google and go to a specific page that's dead set like so targeted on that one particular search topic that it may not fit with the rest of the site so it doesn't have a link in the menu for instance it just is a, a page that stands on its own now you can explore the rest of the site from that page but you can't get to that page from the rest of the site because what you're saying in this particular um landing page may not be relevant for most of what you do it may be a really really tiny little niche thing that you do that isn't necessarily core but in this case this could be in your frequently asked questions yes so if you had an faq section this yep. would be ideal for that's where you do your top 10 questions that people ask you and the top 10 questions you wish people would ask you or do a top five and a top five depends on how much time you want to spend writing so if it's a landing page, you would need to include it in your, um, in your XLM or whatever it is that, um, oh, in your sitemap, in your sitemap. Yeah. So it will appear in that anyway, if you're using something like WordPress, which has a dynamically updating, uh, sitemap and which also then goes through and Google will expand that out when it finds it, it'll show up in that sitemap. Um, definitely if you're using something like Yoast or, um, WPMU yep. Dev, uh, most people use Yoast, nothing on, on Google, I'm yep. sorry, on WordPress. Um, you can actually sell, Yoast will pick it up itself. Okay. And then that will update through your Google Search Console settings. So if you've got it, like that sitemap loaded into Google Search Console, it will yep. automatically pick up that change, usually within about 24 hours. Okay. It's pretty quick these days. Once you play by Google's rules, they reward you for it. Yeah, I think I need to play by their rules a bit better. I'm uh, working, <laughs> working on that as we go. Oh, don't we all? And to answer your question from earlier, um, does Google not penalize you for duplicate content? And this is where I was looking for specific, um, specific areas that we wanted to duplicate that content for. They're perfect examples of landing pages. Um, they will punish you if it's like, you know, really, it's just the same words with the name of the suburb changed. But rather than punished, it just won't, it won't index you well yeah, yeah. Um, for that particular page. But then again, we've had cases where they've done this and it's still ranked really well for very, um, but it won't rank well for Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Hobart, Darwin, Cairns, Townsville, Mackay, bigger centers, but it will rank really well for Emerald, Charleville, Air, Tully, um, you know, uh, Bustleton, Bunbury, smaller places, it will ra rank really well for them, just not for the bigger places. Great. That's great. Yeah. Hopefully that um, helped out answer. Thank you very much for being a volunteer for that. 
Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Really has been like uh, having talk back radio here. <laughs> it's a bit of an experiment. I don't usually run it like this. So still sharing my screen. We've written our blog. I'm going to talk just briefly before we go about syndication. Let me just present this screen and get it back up and running. Uh, you probably notice I use Canva for my presentations. If you're using PowerPoint, use Canva. So much better. Syndication is where you publish your blog elsewhere. So you're not just putting it on your own website. You want to send it off to other places. So it can go to social media. We used to have notes in, um, in Facebook. We don't have them anymore. But we do have articles on LinkedIn, which is a great place to send it off to. Another way to do this is through podcasts. Now, I'm about to crank back up my podcast. So I've given it about a year's rest. What I used to do, I'd write a blog in, a, in a, a voice that was such that I could use that then as a podcast piece as well, as a script for a podcast. It worked really well because I got a piece of audio that was over here. I got a blog over here that went out to lots of different places like LinkedIn as, a, as an article. It would go to Facebook Notes, which are no longer there. It'd go to Blogger. I'd have a Blogger site, a Tumblr that would go out there as well. And I used to publish to a thing called Medium. Now I'm going to starting to do that again. Um, if you can sort of write it in sort of a, a very casual way that feels very natural to talk about, or you can use at least that blog as something that you can riff about a bit um, and not have to follow it like it's a dead, dead stop script. Uh, then turning into a podcast is a really good way of expanding your repertoire a bit, or even get real, 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 like real uh, brave and do it in front of a camera and actually just read it as a script that you're talking to camera with. And that could be used as the basis for maybe a Facebook live, or you can break all that content up. So we were talking about all these different topics and doing those, um, those dot points, those dot points make really good social media posts. So you can use those to build graphics in Canva around. You can use things like video in InVideo, Lumen5, even Canva and Crello. They both make really good short social media videos for you. And that can make it carry a lot further than what it would if it was just in the blog on your website. But this is a question similar to what was asked before um, from Greg. It doesn't this duplicate content elsewhere also get punished by Google? And it actually doesn't. Um, if you're taking that same exact blog from your website and putting it on LinkedIn or putting it on Medium or putting it on any other publishing platform, as long as you put it on the place that you want to have registered first or indexed first on Google, which is your website, then you put it on the others, you're going to be fine. Just don't put the same article exactly the same on multiple pages on your website. That's when they start to get a bit, this is getting real spammy and scammy. We're going to pull back a bit. We won't take you off. We're just going to push you down the rankings just a little bit. So putting it on places like Tumblr, Blogger, LinkedIn, Medium, Quora, which is um, a, like a, it's like a forum, I suppose, a Reddit, Google My Business is the great unwashed masses way of getting some great leverage of your, of your stuff you're doing. Put that stuff out there. I really do recommend you do it. Or create a Google site, sites.google.com. Or in your Google My Business, you can actually build a website that can contain these blog posts as articles that you post or posts that you put in to Google My Business. It gives you extra coverage. And what you want to give Google is lots of data points about who you are and what you do in as many places as possible. Or send stuff off to the newspaper. If you're writing about stuff that's of a, of a, of a local interest, not just a promotional interest for you, then sending off to local newspaper can give you a lot of great coverage as well. That does bring us to the end. Thank you so much to those who were really brave and came on and I kind of forced you. You didn't have to be brave. I just forced you on there anyway. Um, so you can get in touch with me if you want some tips on blogging or if you want, you know, even if you've got a topic that, about your business and you know, this is a stupid offer for me to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, send through to this email address um, what your business name is and what that business does. And I'll send you back 10 ideas for what to write, the 10 questions you can ask to write a blog on using that particular formula. Like I said, this will be available on YouTube a little bit later on, about two hours and take me to convert it over and send it up. Uh, if not, just wait till tomorrow. It'll be on my YouTube channel under Don and James or on Business Station's YouTube channel. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. It's always stressful, but it is always a fun one to do. I have to do this one again in the next couple of months. Have a fantastic week. And I think it's uh, Friday tomorrow. So have a great weekend as well.